AI techniques for entrepreneurial success. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking out the time and being here. Thank you, Olga, for organizing this. So to, the topic for today, uh, you know, before even I introduce, I'm going to request all the panelists to come on stage, please. We have Myrlet, the founder and CEO of Block Tides. Is Myrlet? Okay. Gijang, the founder and CEO of Coxwave. Mr. David Meltzer, the chairman of David Meltzer Enterprises and Samuel, the CEO of Will. Without further ado, I think let's kick start by having a quick round of introduction for all the panelists. Starting with Gijang, if I can request you to start. Hi, uh, I'm the CEO of Coxwave and we're building a, a product called Align AI for monitoring and evaluating the LLM solution. Thank you, uh, David Meltzer, uh, CEO of Sports One Marketing and uh, Dave Meltzer Enterprises, TV, movies, all sports inspirational, aspirational, sports films starting with Jerry Maguire way back when and multiple uh, sports content today. Hello guys, uh, my name is Samuel. I am a tech entrepreneur from New York, uh, AI consulting. Previously I was at TikTok uh, where I was on a global business solutions team. So super excited to be here today. Thank you very much. So let's kick start by, you know, just going to the foundational aspects of how uh, artificial intelligence and more so specifically the Gen AI wave is impacting businesses at large. Uh, there's a lot of dependencies on large language models and using that for the benefits of the enterprises. And there are different sp uh, uh, sections of the journey that an enterprise goes through in which AI elements are introduced. And we can specifically speak about those. But if I can request you to highlight, how do you see artificial intelligence be enabling your businesses and the businesses of your clients? What's the kind of impact have you seen before and after this wave coming in? I think that will be a good thing to start and set the context. Gijan. Yeah, so after, after Gen AI, I think the most important keyword I see is hyper-personalization. And because, uh, because AI is enabling a conversational interface and now we, uh, the user can finally express what they actually want and need and their preference in their own words, the AI can now understand and respond to the ind uh, individualized requirements and because of that, like we can finally give uh, a user a really hyper, hyper, you know, personalized experience that we uh, we never actually experienced before. So yeah, I think that's the biggest like uh, difference that uh, I've been experiencing with my own product as well. So yeah, Mr. David, um, you know, looking at different capabilities within different sizes of organizations, blessed to work with small, medium and some of the Fortune 50 companies. And the ones that are utilizing AI, number one, realize AI is a great servant, not a master. So a lot of the companies that try to use it as a master, they're falling into all kinds of different voided shortages and obstacles in their business. But like you suggest, using it as a servant to facilitate replacement of capability, not people. And so everybody has different capabilities and now we can maximize the human capability and allow the AI to take care of what I call non-time capability, the things that annoy us in humans, which is to one, figure out data quickly, accurate data, and two, repetitive behaviors. AI is extremely good at repetitive behaviors. And so within a sales context, it stimulates interest better than anything else. It transitions interest, it shares a vision, and then it can actually manage and develop that vision through a synthesized quantified uh, analysis. Now, another thing that a lot of people don't realize that AI is being used today is to amplify expertise. Uh, and this is really important in law, uh, large organizations, uh, even, even in ours, and I only have a few hundred people in our organization, but to be able to have every employee take an email and say, rewrite this email as if I'm David Meltzer, speaker, author, entrepreneur. And 
the voice changes so we can have these low beginning entry level people now take on the same intellect, intuition and inspiration as the leaders in the organization. And that can happen throughout the process. So I think if you're going to utilize uh, AI in your organization, look at capabilities, not people, and then replace the capabilities so that your people can utilize their great human capability to and not waste time on what AI could do much better. That's a, that's some very interesting points, Mr. David, that you have mentioned. I would love to follow up on that. But before that, I want to take some points from Samuel. What do you think? Absolutely. Uh, everything he was saying makes 100% uh, sense. Uh, one thing that we need to utilize today, uh, understand, is that data is the new gold mine, right? But not just any data, but proprietary data is really what's going to revolutionize uh, how you utilize AI today. Uh, there is a, a shortage of AI talent, right? So entrepreneurs and businesses need to work with educational institutes to uh, facilitate uh, a talent pipeline, right? More also investing and reskilling really on AI talents, like helping your employees understand how to utilize AI the right way and also coaching and mentoring them so that that way, uh, you know, nothing really backfires in your company. Uh, last but not least, uh, it has to be uh, in alignment with your mission and values of your company. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So I think uh, let's let's break down the uh, impact of AI into three aspects because we have like three experts from uh, different fields. Uh, the, the way AI is defined to impact organizations is let's say around 70% of the organizations are using AI to prevent leakages and bring in operational efficiencies. About 15 to 20% to impact their top line and create some revenue generating line and 5 to 10% to disrupt, like create something new altogether. Now these implications are different from a B2C model, that is where the creative uh, part come into picture, uh, a B2B model where large enterprises comes into picture. Uh, so how do we see the differentiation in the two, if I may ask. And Mr. David, if I can start with you to highlight more on the B2B side, uh, like how are the enterprises being impacted and do you also see these trends the way I explained, or do you see something different? Oh, no, I see an enormous amount of strength. It really, it's the amount of data that has been underutilized. So in the context of B2B, a lot of people have gathered all of this data and never known how or what to do with it. And, and I'm talking about anywhere from a $10 million to a multi-billion dollar organization. They've gathered all of this eclectic, unorganized and disparate information that AI itself is so powerful to synthesize the data and create opportunities that can exponentially grow a business. And it does it so quickly. You know, human beings don't have a capability of figuring out from disparate data, any type of congruencies or incongruencies aligned with different business models or different business objectives. So in the B2B space, I see the biggest opportunity is in going backwards, seeing what data we've actually already created. And then of course, once they do that, they can create new systems with AI in order to effectuate aggregating and accelerating the amount of data. But now it's completely aligned with the business objectives in a B2B business. Very interesting. And at the same time, but you mentioned about data, right? And everything around AI is more data and that is where large language models and now even SLMs are becoming relevant. But there are also some risks associated with the way you utilize and the way you build using LLMs. Gijan, would you like to talk about this particular uh, topic highlighting the risks that comes with this? Yeah, so people should be aware of the risk that LLMs or AI inherently has. And like, as you guys probably like heard about the hallucination where you know, AI just spits out like uh, lies to the user. And this is a actually very problematic uh, thing because if the user, ex uh, if the user actually realize that they are, the AI is lying and then if they actually build the distrust into the AI system, why would they even pay for the, pro uh, pay for the product or even use it? So it's really important to mitigate this kind of risk and AI has inherently has a lot of different problems. And it's really important to like monitor all the conversation between that happens between the user and AI 
and you have to analyze like what or why it happens, when it happens, how often it happens, etc. And then if you continuously do that iteratively and then find each problem at the same time and then fix it uh, in fix it and then in the end you can finally uh, build a AA system that's actually safe, reliable and user friendly. But yeah, right now it's still the problem is still there and but I, I see it as a opportunity to, you know, fix it and build business out of it. Interesting. And uh, Samuel, before I come to you, that this is precisely why I wanted to discuss the pros and cons of using the data, because the kind of industry that you specialize in, which is on the more creative side of things, we are seeing a lot of disruption, which is visible to the larger consumer. What the, when when, uh, when uh, you know innovations are happening on the B2B side versus when innovation happens on the creative side, everybody sees on social media, right? So what's your take on this? How are you seeing utilization of data? And if you can throw some light around your point of view on the privacy aspects associated with that, because again, the larger people get involved and it is on the social media all over the place. How are you seeing the trends shaping up there? Wow, oh, that's, a, that's a really good question. We're, we're gonna notice that the younger generation, they're using social media more, right? And they're the digital natives as we know it. Okay, I bring this up because a lot of companies today, they struggle with content creation. And with the utilization of AI, you can make personalized content that will resonate with your audience, right? That will help you create something to bring more brand loyalty, right? But another thing that we, that we need to focus on is the privacy aspect of it, uh, being transparent with the data and how you're using the data right? Uh, there has to be consequences for companies that are not transparent about how they're utilizing data uh, and the governance behind that. Uh, when it comes to the content creation aspect, we're going to notice more companies uh, just trying to put something out there, right? Just, just to have a brand name for themselves, right? So there has to be more education around that. Yeah, Mr. David, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I, th I think it's really important when we're dealing with content. And I personally never thought, you know, as a middle-aged executive uh, that I would have more followers than all my kids. Um, <laughs> but part of the reason I've been able to build a big community via social media, even though I don't look like your normal TikToker, um, <laughs> is because I use AI in order to translate my ideas. One of the things even way back in like 2013, when I started a professional speaking career, half the audience I could see in their face, it, excuse my language, but like, what the F is he just talking about? <laughs> like he, even six year old men could understand me. And so it's so nice to be able to identify the audience that you're looking for on the different platforms and within seconds translated into 19 year old language, um, yeah. which is suit. And not just audio, but, you know, text and video, being able to understand exactly. And it's taking the analytics of actually from what's working, what's going viral and putting it out there. I, I just did a really viral video and it, it was all AI because I just asked, hey, what's the most controversial uh, topic in America that I could talk about in and, and what position should I take? And it told me to talk about California taxes and be pro paying California taxes because so many people are moving to avoid taxes, state taxes. And lo and behold, I never would have done a video like that. And I'm not sure I really believe the position that I took anyways, but I was just trying to build awareness to my brand so they could really understand through the thousands of videos who I am and what I really want to do. But it was genius because that video killed it. And, you know, <laughs> people were agreeing and disagreeing with me and they created a whole conversation around it. So really, really powerful with what Sam does, but you can convert what you're saying into the language of the people that you're looking for and the subject matter topic or expertise that they're looking for as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's exactly where the lines between individual content creators using these uh, AI technologies and enterprises also wanting to establish a brand and reach their consumers who are now becoming used to seeing this kind of technologies. 
are coming together. There's a lot of convergence that we are seeing, right? Companies who want to promote and come out with advertisements, they are relying on this. They are working with individual content creators who rely on these technologies and create some uh, established advertisements out of that. And that is where some element of the point that you mentioned, Gijang, the personalization also comes into picture. Now, um, when I say that, I'm connecting the dot with the point you raised about individuals seeking personalization versus now even the enterprises who want to create more personalized feel of advertisements, right? So how do you see the two coming together and the role analytics play around that to kind of judge, okay, what is working and what is not working? How do I improvise? Yeah, in the end, like enterprises comprised of all the individual, you know, employees and team members. So it's right now like AI, like Gen AI is moving towards like hyper personalization and, and each individual is able to like create like hyper personalized contents like within seconds. And which means in the end, enterprise is, as I said, like comprised of like individuals and because individuals are able to create such a, a contents within seconds, like now uh, enterprises are able to create like individual, uh, like hyper-personalized contents within seconds as well. So, and even my company, like we, like we send out emails, like about back in, like be uh, before like Gen AI, we were, we weren't able to send a personalized email to all the customers. Like we were using a template, but nowadays like we can actually change all the emails that are like really set to actual like really you know personalized to each uh companies that we're uh, each clients that we're talking to and i think this just trends will just accelerate as as the time goes by and then yeah yeah that's right and this will be a perfect time for us to start diving deeper now and maybe let's talk about some specific use cases Right. Uh, and more importantly, uh, if we can talk about uh, uh, Mr. David, I'll start with you. Uh, you raised a very good point at the uh, beginning of this panel on how AI is supposed to serve you and not master you. There's a big myth which is going around that if AI is coming into picture, jobs are going to go away and all that thing. Right. So if you can take some examples of the use cases that you have seen around that you're helping your clients build with and how this technology is helping rather than looking to replace anything. Yeah, so let's use sales, for example, uh, because of the cold calling uh, aspect of quantitative value that you can reach so many people. Number one, with AI, the total addressable community of people that want to help each other, know people that can help each other. In other words, people that will buy from you and sell for you for life is insurmountable. 7.6 billion people. And so because of AI, you now can hit so many different, when, uh, I'm old as that's obvious, it would take me over a month to contact a thousand people. It would take me over a month to contact a thousand people. Now today, utilizing AI as my servant, I can reach millions of people. And then I can actually synthesize the data from the millions of people. The aspect and difference between using it as my master or a servant is the same thing that happens in human nature, which is illumination. So one thing that I've uh, realized in just what I do as a person, as a leader, is I illuminate the truth because I believe that there's only two types of people in the world, humble people and those that are about to be. And <laughs> AI can help with that. So when I consult with even my own company and others, if you're gonna use and reach a million people in a day and ask a question, would it help you if, the best thing you can do is start off and say, hi, this is the AI version of David Meltzer. And so in a cold calling capacity, you're illuminating the fact and all of a sudden it actually puts someone at ease because they know you're using AI as a servant. Where instead, so many people with IVRs all types of virtual and augmented reality, the, the energy and frequency of what they're doing is so disparate from the truth that even if someone hasn't figured it out, they're going to create resistance to what you're trying to do instead of ease. And so if you can use the AI as your servant, it's okay to say, hey, this is my driver. No, no offense. <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead of some false facade of whatever it is. And that's the problem right now 
with social media, right? People standing in front of cars they don't own, houses they don't own. There's a huge gap. And this is where I think AI is a great servant between I am and this is what I want people to think I am. And so if you can use AI to reestablish who you really are as a company, as an individual content creator, and stay away from this is what I want people to think I am, now you're using AI as your servant and it's going to, and with its capabilities, create exponential, exponential outcomes, aggregation and acceleration in your business, which are the three characteristics, ironically, of energy. And when you have the correct frequency and the correct energy, you'll find this unbelievable growth in your business. Very, very interesting. And I'm sure, Samuel, you have a lot to talk about. Sam this. taught me all this, by the way. So he's sitting here going, God damn it, David, you stole all my stuff. You right. took away all his points, is it? <laughs> I hired him. That's easy. <laughs> Samuel, if I can request you to elaborate on those, please. Within, within the next two to three years, more people are going to be open to the idea of using AI, of having their own personal AI that's fed on their data, right? Uh, this would be personal language models, not large language models that we know. So imagine uh, David here, for, for instance, uh, he has millions of followers, right? Or if you want to reestablish your personal brand, you can say, okay, I have all this information, all this knowledge that I have about myself, everything I've learned from the day I was five to the day I was, you know, 50 years old, and you can feed it into a personal language model all about yourself. Now, if you were to go out and meet somebody, if you have a million followers, you can't reach out to a million followers. If you're trying to establish yourself in a, as your, you know, your personal brand or your business, you can't reach out to everybody. So there'll be a way for people to reach out to your personal AI and ask you a question and it will respond in your tone, your mannerism and give your same knowledge, the same thing you're fit that AI. Uh, I think more people are gonna be open to that idea. Uh, another thing is uh, deep fakes. Right. Well, that's something that we we have to be very conscientious of because we're given all our free data. Like I said before, proprietary data is key. Data data is a gold mine right now. We're giving our all our data to the social media networks and, you know, for a free service. Now, you cannot be upset if a social media service is selling your data. Right. You willingly gave that data to them. So we have to be very conscientious back to the data, data privacy, how our data is being used, how it's being stored, where it's going. And also, uh, you got to have a system with your family or your business on how to combat uh, deep fakes. So, for instance, if David is traveling somewhere and it's actually not him, someone used a deep fake of David's voice, his likeness, and try to uh, scam his family for you know, $10 million dollars. How can he now come back to his family and say, hey, I am safe. It is not me. Uh, can you create a keyword with your family or a, a, a secret key with your business to let them know that it is not you, that it's actually, you know, someone trying to scam you? So those are the things that we have to foresee within the next three to five years. Very, very interesting. Gijang, would you like to add something to that? What's your point of view? Oh, okay. I'm just, just so you know, nobody can scam me because my wife will not let me spend any money. So you'd have to scam her. Yeah, that's why right. personal language model training is important now. <laughs> but and and that's a uh, that's a very very good point to uh, touch upon. Like um, a good term, rather personal language model, where personalized AI assistants are being sought after, and that's a billion dollar industry in itself, which is shaping up. Now, I've worked with many people who are trying to innovate in this space and create personal AI assistants, like Replica AI is one that has done pretty well so far. Uh, and now we are seeing more in the consumer as well as B2B space uh, 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 creating these kind of personalized uh, AI assistants, even in the legal space for that matter. Now, uh, we have uh, uh, PwC representatives here. They have made uh, a product, Amy, uh, which is supposed to be your legal assistant. You interact with them and ask for legal consultations, right? So which helps uh, re reducing uh, our costs uh, to an extent where mundane questions can at least be addressed. Uh, so how do you how do you see uh, how do you see this specific industry where personalized AI assistance 
is shaping up and becoming more mainstream. Uh, do you see that aiding the larger end goal that generative AI aims to solve when solving the business problems? Or do you see as a completely independent piece and because you are becoming more digital uh, and hence we, are, we it is important that what kind of personality and what kind of friends do we have in the digital space as well, right? So this kind of differentiation, if I, uh, Samuel, if I can ask you, uh, uh, because in the social media world, this is shaping up to be the fastest acceptance, if you will. Right. Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. Uh, one thing that I want us to go back on is uh, psychology. It all boils down to psychology, marketing, psychology. Every day you have to sell that psychology, how you're selling, what you're saying, to whom, right? And another thing we need to understand is that AI is modeled around. We're, we're building AI systems that is meant to mimic our brains, right? Just like us, who we are. So when everything is personalized, it will be uh, utilizing AI systems. It will be really difficult to know if this is from a human or if this is from an AI system. Uh, with content creation, that's something that we're, we're really going to see more of because more people want personalized content for them. They want personalized ads. They, uh, people are selfish, and that's the truth. And when you're utilizing AI, you have to be a little selfish because you have a goal in mind, but you also have to be ethical about it. So when it comes to being creative, I think AI is going to help people unlock that next step. It's going to help them become more creative. It's going to help them see things and different problems that they never thought of before. So it's going to be a catalyst for change. Very interesting. And I think uh, let's uh, press a reset button here. We have our four panelists, Manitou, joining us. Okay. Thank you. Hello, guys. So they didn't saw yeah, my name yeah, yeah. in the ticketing. So that's why I'm late. But anyway, I'm Myrtle Ramos. I'm from the Philippines. I'm the founder of Block Tides. And um, we're actually a tech firm here for blockchain and crypto and AI. And at the same time, I'm one of the KOLs of CoinMarketCap and Forbes Business Council. Oh, hi, Miss Jane. Hello. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, that's my introduction. So, what's the question earlier? No, so, uh, what, we have, so I, I, uh, what we are speaking about currently is the role Generative AI has played in the B2B segment, the B2C segment, and now specifically we were talking about the growth of personalized AI assistance, like the example I took is of Replica AI, where you know personal companions are uh, becoming mainstream. So uh, how are there, how are there like literally two industries which are forming within the AI space as well? One is to aid the businesses and one is to kind of really provide a companion level support uh, uh, to individuals. So what would So basically blockchain now and cryptocurrency, most of the coins that are actually trending now are AI coins and projects. So what I uh, what uh, my opinion when it comes to B2B, so I'm also the group CMO of Stainex. So it's real world assets when it comes to integrating AI, integrating real world assets and NFTs. So, of course, there's a connotation and skepticism when it comes to NFTs that is only a JPEG, right? So, that's the reason why we actually come up with a decision to put more benefits as a membership when it comes to integrating AI, when it comes to curation for your travel, when it comes to your membership, of course. For example, uh, when you actually pull up your Waze or Google Maps, um, you can actually use our platform already for you to determine if there's a traffic inside using AI or if there's any accidents or if it's a populated area. So there's a lot of AIs, to be honest, right? There's generative. There's actually, uh, it's, it's really machine learning. So AI is just a term, but it's really machine learning. It existed ever since, guys. So it's just really becoming hype now because of chat GPT right so there's a lot of purposes so generative ais are just one thing but when it comes to of course ethical uh ethical considerations there's a lot of uh, fear when it comes to ai right that that they are fearing that they will take over the world or whatever but when it comes to this we need to have proper regulations when it comes to b2b just like in cryptocurrency 
Because, you know, without proper regulation in such technology, it will be a chaos. Interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, there's one thing that has always made me curious about the way uh, AI assistance and their adoption is increasing. Now, ChatGPT, of course, set the trend. Um, and now we are hearing more competitors of ChatGPT, which are coming in, Google Drive. And now we have uh, uh, from our own India, QX Labs, Ask QX. Uh, they have 15 million users supporting like more than 100 languages uh, and like really catering to region, uh, uh, making the AI assistance regional, going to the deep roots where anybody and everybody can access information using this uh, Gen AI models. So Gijang, if I can ask you, when there are different products which are coming in, right? What is it that you think drives the adoption? What is it that you think makes a consumer choose one over the other in this age and uh, uh, accordingly build on top of it using that foundation? As a, like, I use Gen AI products a lot as well. And then I use ChatGPT, like Pod, uh, like those like similar looking chat uh, service as well. But like, as I use it more and more, like back in back, like traditional products, or like if I use it for like one month or two months, then I just stick with the product for like the next like six, one year. But this Gen AI product is a little different because it has a, it, like most of the products has similar interfaces and, and the way it behaves is really similar too. So it really depends on the quality of the output, the response that the AI gives. And because of that, I like, I personally use, like, I personally just use ChatGPT when they update and then if, if the other uh, product gets an update, I try to use it as well. And then if, if they give me a better quality responses, I can just, you know, I can just change to a new product. So, and the, it's, it's really easy to, you know, change the product one by one. So I think for the next few months, I think it's the most important thing, the most important thing for the companies to focus is the performance and the, you know, performance of the output. And the performance is really re related to the personalized experience. So I think that's, that's why uh, the companies have to focus right now. Very interesting. Mr. David, what's your take on that? And uh, also if you can touch uh, uh, a bit upon the way funding is being attracted into these products and uh, uh, what in your experience drives the decision making uh, where okay do I need to put my money here or uh, is this going to be a product which is going to be successful if you can add some light on that yeah sure um, you know I, I ran the most notable sports agency in the world with Lee Steiberg and we used to say in order to be a great sports agent you had to do two things you had to get a client and keep them and so the same thing holds true with these solutions. You have to get the person, so it's all marketing. Uh, but one thing that we've learned, it's all, especially with AI, in managing and developing the vision aligned with three things that change after someone adopts a, a new solution. Time will change, value will change, and emotion change. And so the best solutions that get 50 million users have great marketing because they get the client, but they also are aligned with the time value and emotion that changes with something that's really difficult. It was much easier representing Troy Aikman, Steve Young, Warren Moon, Chicharito, whoever you like. It was easy because it didn't change that fast. Baseball in America, soccer, football, it has not changed. But AI changes so swiftly that the company, companies that grow the fastest and the ones that get the investment can prove how are we going to stay aligned with the time, value, and emotion to manage and develop the vision while we're still attracting new clients as well? And so the dollars are going to today the best marketers, but also the best strategies that are aligned with time, value, and emotion and actually can articulate it. One of the other difficulties in all technologies, but especially AI, which I'm sure you'll agree with because you're the ideal person to raise money. Most people that are smart enough to figure this shit out aren't capable of articulating the value. So they need to hire people like me that don't know what the F I'm talking about, but I'm really good at talking. And so they'll teach me how to articulate the value. Um, and I see a lot of companies not getting funded because they're letting a leader who 
is extremely intelligent in the technology side of things, but completely incapable of articulating the value of the business. And so therefore they wonder, even though we have a better solution, why we can't raise money. Very interesting well, point. Simon, please. When a paradigm shift takes place, that's when people start to see things from a different scope, right? Uh, that's one word that always stuck with me, paradigm shift. Uh, the next one is FOMO, fear of missing out. You were asking, uh, you know, the adoption rate. When you see your friends using certain AIs and they're happy about it, even if they don't know it, people talk, right? It, people refer things to each other. People who they like, trusting, you know, they know. So once people start using a certain product and people are happy about it, they share it with their friends. Another thing I've noticed is gamification. You have to gamify this. Uh, our attention span is so short. Like for me, really short. You know, since I've been on TikTok, man, I, man, just scrolling and scrolling. And I used to work at TikTok. So I, I've, I noticed that the younger generation, if nothing aligns with their, their values, if nothing aligns with what they like, they're scrolling. They're not going to buy from your product. They don't care if you have the best product in the world. It, ha it has to be attached to a mission. It has to be attached to something that's on a bigger scale, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really much what I want to add. So, I guess I'm the last one. So, basically, when it comes to funding, um, AI is just there, to be honest. But in our company, we help companies raise funds. So, in total, since 2017, it's $50 million. I'm assisting them, basically, in raising funds. In my own project, I raised $5 million. Uh, it's a gamified um, aspect. But I left. Why? Because I'm not ROI-based. I'm more on integrity because when you're in it for the money, I will leave you. So basically, when it comes to purpose, of course, purpose based, that's the reason why I left, even though I uh, actually raised $5 million. And I will not actually be ashamed of leaving that. So basically, I'm focused more because I'm building a Letify, that AI, for block tides, by block tides, because it's going to be like um, a jurisdiction when it comes to community based voting. And at the same time, when it comes to legitimate suppliers, resources, when it comes to events. Because there's a lot of scammers out there when it comes to events. Only charging people ridiculous fees. But of course, when it comes to authenticity, the value, that's what we're building actually. And not to mention, we want to build basically cybersecurity in incorporating that. Why? Because there's a lot of people, especially identity theft, being stolen. Because I'm one of the victims of identity theft as well. So basically, we need to reiterate the importance of cybersecurity because there's a lot of people not knowledgeable enough when it comes to their personal info being stolen, their financial information. And at the same time, that's the reason why AI, yes, it's scary, but at the same time, there's a lot of good people, knowledgeable people who can actually build more better products. And, of course, when it comes to fundraising, of course, it's not just about the money, guys. You have the dream, push it. If you don't execute it, of course, nothing will happen. And at the same time, incorporate good people with your team, the trustworthy. Because, you know, that's where you're, fl uh, where you're going to flourish when it comes to your project and business. I've been in this space for seven years, almost eight years now, and... Credibility is very important. If you're just in it for the money for one time, big time shot, you're not gonna last. Because basically, reputation is what you need when it comes to building a business, supporting someone, even in, in just being a community member in your country. Reputation, credibility, right? So marketing is very important, of course, because if you cannot actually push yourself out there, your project will not be seen. And at the same time, last thing, do not ever, uh, when it comes to the lack mentality and pushing forward the funds when it comes to marketing, because marketing is forever. Uh, according to Bill Gates, if there's one thing that uh, he's actually uh, going to purchase when he has $1 left, it's for marketing and PR. Thank you, guys. Wow, love it. That was so nicely put together. And I think I can see a round of applause going in the audience. It was actually a mic drop moment. 
But since we have more two and a half minutes, I'm going to uh, open up it for the audience if you have any questions, I'm sure. Yeah. Can we please have a... Okay. Hi, guys. Hello. Uh, very inspiring. I've been following David's and Samuel's work for some time. So uh, just a bit of... Uh, we, we build digital infrastructure for the sporting properties around the world, clubs, leagues, federations, to achieve two important things, which is uh, deeper fan engagement and also the creation of new revenues. Now, over the past month, I uh, spoke at three different conferences, one at the uh, Microsoft Global Sports Innovation Center in London, one at World Football Summit at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium last week, and also one at Borussia Dortmund Stadium on blockchain as well. And one thing that seems to be very, very much a talking point is the data aspect of it. And especially the question to you, David and Samuel, when do you think the owners and the senior management of the sporting properties, whether it's football clubs or basketball clubs, will realize they're actually today running a data and media business much more than the business of football, because uh, certain elements of the data acquisition is what's actually getting uh, huge attention. And the second point, uh, Samuel, you mentioned the importance of the community and fans. Uh, obviously, the biggest asset of uh, clubs around the world is their fan base, which at the moment in the web through has been really screwed over because they've not benefited as the content creators. So if we think about clubs around the world with millions of fans uh, that the big sporting uh, properties actually got access to, but they're not sharing the upside, I think whoever manages to figure out the way forward between web 2 and web 3 will not only retain its fan base, but also attract the new ones around the world. And uh, on the private LLM and Gen AI, I've got separate questions for the other two speakers. No, uh, but if I can just request to keep it a little quick, considering the time, please. Yeah, just real quickly, in sports, once the upper management, the executives, owners realize that people buy on emotion for logical reasons, and that technology today can identify the emotions that are best aligned with the quantitative side, of doing business in sports. And I believe that sports has always been about building a community and it's this simple to me. Community people that are there to help one another and know people that can help one another. That's what happens at every game around the world. There's a bunch of people with a common interest, but they're there to help one another and know people that can help one another. They're the ones that buy from you and sell for you for life. And that's why sports is such a profitable business today. But once the executives realize this is all on the emotional side, always has been, and people buy on emotion for logical reasons, they'll put it all together and make a ton of money, help a ton of people and have a, a lot of fun like they always do. Yeah. What David said is an alignment what I'm gonna say. Uh, it's a paradigm shift, right? That's really what it boils down to. Uh, also emotion, like David was saying, but uh, fear of missing out. Once they realize that what they're doing has not been working, they're gonna look for a different avenue to help them create uh, a better revenue uh, streams and uh, utilize their community better. So it just boils down to that. Great. Uh, I think if we can take it offline then, so I can't take the time limit. Thank you so much, panelists. This was a fantastic panel. We touched on so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.